reception specialist. And I started by noticing in the world what I was most obsessed with, and it was movement, something incredibly invisible and maybe not noticeable to a lot of people. But because my attention went there all the time, from the time I was a little tadpole, I decided that I'm going to spend my whole life on this. I don't care how impractical it is. I'm sure many of you have made that very same decision. We really believe that action is about the now, the present tense. It's not what just happened. It's not what will happen. And the notion is gathering sort of an anthropological grouping of extreme action out in the world has been my quest. Exploring places where action and theater collide. The odd thing about what I do is that I work in an artificial medium, this proscenium. So the first thing I have to ask is where? What is place? And intersect that with the mystery of movement. And the actions of the body. And always remembering that you don't know what you're looking for. This is a great quote from Tim Cahill. The explorer is a person who is lost. So you can always reassure yourself if you feel like, wow, what a mess I got myself in. <laughs> you know that being lost is really where it's at. So what if the movement you're thinking of really only takes one second? What if you decide you want to show the effect of action on substance, like that last image, where you want to dive through glass? Because it's emblematic of really something very critical that you can't name. You can only do that. All of you can do this if you really wanted to. Dive through glass, I mean. Or you could come to my studio and I'll teach you. The first thing I had to consider is what my competition is in the world. What are physical human reference points? And it is the ground, water, and air. And given the minuteness, size-wise, of the human, I had to throw the bodies into this enormous spe spectacle, which is space, ground, and figure out how I could ever have any effect on that at all with the human form. So how does place figure in the experience of action and how to have an effect on space with action? That's why I have always believed that humans could fly. Um, there is some pretty music that goes with this if you want to put it on. I'll talk over it. Thank you. Uh, you could keep it a little lower than that. So the notion would be, the notion would be, what happens if my ultimate, you have to have a kernel of an idea. My kernel was, wow, I bet people could fly. You know, not with machines. But maybe no one's ever tried because you don't have hollow bones, you've got pretty dense muscles, this and that. And there's another problem with flying. Eventually, you've got to come down. And another great hero of mine, Evil Knievel, said, I never had any trouble with a takeoff. It's the landing that's a problem. <laughs> and what did Streb do most essentially? You see these full muscle bodies. That is not going to be pretty when they hit the ground. But we learned how to do it. And when you've got a body just thrown into space, you also have to consider the context. And this is a Ridley quote. But how do I figure out how to frame the actions we're doing separate from the impact that we have to encounter? And have you be affected? by the actions we're doing. So, so far, theater is like this. You're sitting mostly in the dark, doing nothing. There's a whole behavioral code strapped onto you. You can't talk, eat, drink, have sex. Um, so you leave kind of the stuff of life at the door. So up here, I want to figure out how to make your experience purely physical. That's my subject. How do we see action? So I tried to go into other fields and notice what proportionality meant scientifically. What is action's vanishing point? And I, I posit that dance and action, staged action, has not examined this clearly enough. What is your angle of viewing, and therefore, what I construct action-wise on stage, what are you going to see? And I decided that, that, that the, the uh-oh. Watch the fly. I decided that the vanishing point for action is the horizon line, where the horizontal meets the vertical. And that's how, no matter where you are, if you're in a proscenium like this, if you're outside, if you're looking at your friend, 
That's how you separate space. And the line going to the circle are for me the most profound ideas in the construction of anything that has to fit into space. But I'm dealing with an invisible form. If action's a verb, can it be the subject? How do I create a paradigm shift of attention so that you're not looking at gorgeous bodies, even though they're up here doing the stuff, but that you're noticing the actions that we do? That's what I think it is. But that's my arena, the proscenium. So I'm up against it, basically. I believe in presenting artificial events. I believe that the gathering of people is critical. This is the proportionality. This is the golden mean. Some of you might recognize it, but I think this is so profound. Look, you lose the square. This thing right here, I try and mimic that classic arch. You lose the square. You're left with the exact same rectangle, only smaller. Lose the square, left with a rectangle. Lose the square, left with a rectangle. Lose it. Isn't it incredible to infinite regression? So how do I listen to those who have examined proportionality in the scale of the human, et cetera, et cetera, and be able to construct my actions, even though they're invisible, in such a way that I'm not ignoring very critical ideas of time and space? So what I did is also very impractical. I decided that I had to bring onto a stage like this a framing device. And that framing device is um, something that I also wanted to mimic another form with. And all of you will notice this as a rock and roll box truss. And I have to say that this happened in 1997. And there's the first one. And it was probably economically not wise. Because rather than just being tights and lights, um, which a lot of dance companies are, all of a sudden I had to take a 53-foot truck with me on the road. And no matter how popular I was, I have to say some presenters really were offended by that idea. But because of this, you can see humans down there. Because of this, I was really able to take the size of a human, contend with it, put it in this frame, attach all of our rigging to the frame, because again, we have to have hardware to fly at this, at this juncture anyway. And um, I was completely self-contained, except for the part of the truck and how many thousands of dollars that costs. Um, nothing like that. I, I wasn't very economically, I didn't really pay attention to anything like that. I think it's really probably the first thing is the idea, and then you figure out how to pay for it. And then if you end up in a problem, then you, then you worry about that. Um, I'm the kind of person who has no 401k, no retirement plan, no nothing, because I'm not, I think that one of the reasons action people, and, and it's just the way it is in the action world, you just can't worry, I'm a present tense person, you can't worry about the future. Like tomorrow I'll get up and I'll go, oh, I've got to eat, what am I going to do? <laughs> um, this is body grammar. What is the grammar, the syntax, the declension of the human body? Are the knees and the hips similar? I won't go through that whole video. So if I could somehow do an analysis of the body itself as a language statement, then um, you know, perhaps the same set of questions with space and time, et cetera, um, I would be able to be more articulate with my language, with the building of my physical language. This, this piece is called Moon. And as you can see, it's a very, very simple idea. Um, the dancers are on a 20 by 20 foot frictionless surface. And their base of support switches, in this sense, to their sides. I have an overhead camera. And then we project it on the vertical screen. What I attempt to do in almost every piece I make is to twist time and space to a kind of anti-gravity place so that the temporality and the spatialness of it will be not Earth-like. Maybe it's like gravity on the moon. And that's why I call this moon. I have never been to the moon. So there are some artifices that I incorporate to imagine what it would be like there. But what's so beautiful about doing this sort of matrix one-like thing where the, 
So what we try and do is take an idea like this, take an idea like this and try and then do it in real space. I have not accomplished that yet though. <laughs> the other aspect, th that just demonstrated we change our base of support. Dance normally. If you have this whole surface of the area of the body, as Nina was describing, to be on, I got into the dance world sort of by default because I majored in it in college. I just, that's what I checked off, so I went ahead and did it. <laughs> but my question is, why only be always on the bottoms of your feet? Why is your point of departure from there to there? I didn't get it. So that was really necessary to get out of your physical comfort zone, change your base of support. I collaborate with a mathematician, Barry Sipra. The other idea that we use a lot in my work is danger and emergency situations. A lot of my constructions have to do with establishing what will create a turbulent universe and how are we gonna be able to survive there. So it's not so regimented or presentational. Do you, do you know what that is? I think some of you oceanographers out there will know that. That's a shark, that's a surfer, that's a bad situation. <laughs> so in this, do you have some sound, sound for this? This is called ricochet. And so what, what I did here was I tried to reinvent the floor vertically, very simple. I froze that wall, which is technically and in, 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 in traditionally unbelievably hard to do. And I asked the dancers to not just change their base of support as they slam into this wall, but alter it on a 90 degree set, set of physical principles. <laughs> Can you go from flat to perpendicular, back to flat, and can you aim your base, like do target practicing with your body, and be able to land safely? I look out into the world just like I look at space in place, and I think of turbulence. And I think of the turbulence in the world that I'm trying to figure out how to bring inside without debilitating it. These guys are constantly like just jumping out of airplanes with equipment. I'm, by the way, I'm a hardware junkie. Also, I love hardware just about as much as I love action. Now, this bull, I've studied boxing, bull riding. This is uh, bodacious, and everyone's heard of that eight seconds of hell on the back of a bull. You just have to stay on for eight seconds. But my notion of, could I figure out how to bring that eight seconds inside and go wild with it? That's me diving through glass a few years ago. I'm not a scientist or a physicist, but I try to understand. I don't believe I can control timing. It's, I set up physical structures, we invent the physical vocabulary, and then time ends up being an emergent principle. I think any time I've ever tried to control time, it's been a mistake. <laughs> or it's, it's made it very artificial and the, so fake. But I, I know that everybody, not just this room, but the world recognizes intense movement. This is an overhead view of two cement blocks that I hung up in the studio, you can see them. And the grid is where the dancers can be at certain times, but better not be at other times. <laughs> this is an early raw rehearsal in our slam lab, which all of you are invited to. Does this look like something you'd like to do? <laughs> you, you can't imagine how fun it is. Then you, you get out of the studio and at night you go out and you go, guess what? I didn't get hit by the block, you know. <laughs> Nobody knows what you're talking about. But the idea of putting a pendulum on stage, what is more truly honest and real than a swing? I felt like it was the first temporal construction I made that was temporal first and physical second. This is just how we stage it then. The whole thing about horizontal to vertical, I have an upstage screen, I painted the floor, and you see it projected upstage, it'll draw back in a second, and the dancers then, the audience gets to sort of bifurcate the angle of viewing a little bit, so that I can figure out what is purely a visual 
envelope here, how to create a more three-dimensional experience for all of you. Then, where the dancers go, this is each one of these slices are drawn by the dancers in that previous dance. This is their pathway throughout this dance. And it's completely consistent. That's all of their pathways. And they, they do, just like that perfect arc I showed you, they have to do those pathways every single time. Then the whole question comes about context. I'm just gonna go through this a little bit. This is my garage in Williamsburg that I'm inviting you all to. It would probably not look very inviting like that. But we've, I've decided that normal theaters are not, cannot be the only place that action occurs. And I've thought about factories. This is my sister. We were both adopted, so I never really knew my biological family. So I felt a little bad about kinship, that speech the other day, but. Um, <laughs> but what about me? <laughs> no. Um, and this is my sister right now. You know, she just went to high school, barely got out of it. I'm 57, she's 58. She's working for $8 an hour in a Michigan factory, just like my father said she would be. But labor, I grew up in a very working class fa um, family, and the cement blocks are actually um, a, a homage to my dad. And I think that my work really is about labor and people that still, most people still, who have to carry heavy things from one place to another, I have more regard for that kind of physicality than I do for the privilege of uh, exhibiting uh, skilled moves. These are so, some things I've collected about what would audience sovereignty look like if the theater rules changed a little bit. This is Slam, and that's Carrie Hadley right there in the audience. Do you see her? Isn't she amazing? She runs this opera house, Candom Opera House. She's the boss here, and she came to Slam. And this is how we gather. It's very viral. We have shows there. And then you see um, hundreds and hundreds of kids. I'm trying to learn from Jane Jacobs to create a place in the jumping, joyous jumble of life. How to do that? Why do that? I think as every artist tries to do, to create a neurological heart-stopping moment that, like a singer singing a high C, you just get moved. Just gonna go through some of these pieces of equipment. This is called air. Can't do that without the bungees. This is called fly. It's a Newtonian lever device, weighing about 400 pounds on one side. But I put the groundlings in there so you could see what it's like not to weigh 12 pounds. This is at Wolf Trap, where we were commissioned to celebrate the Wright Brothers' anniversary of flight. How do you get a body in the air and stay there? Put a bunch of them in the air, use a trampoline, I don't know. But if you have a body in the air pretty much constantly, Maybe, maybe, maybe it would mean that some of you would go home and try this on your mattress in your hotel. <laughs> maybe not. Do it when no one's looking. Take a running leap, fly, land. <laughs> the amazing thing about this is when you do that, you punch and you land, you can't still be traveling when you hit. Otherwise, you will you know, scrape your kneecaps off. So it's like air aim, and you got to stop without a wall. We were invited by Cirque du Soleil to celebrate their 20th anniversary in Montreal. It was one of the big honors of my life, about 04. And I analyzed what the difference is between circus and strep. I'll tell you that sometime. <laughs> That's Madison Square Garden. Basic research, we all know. Shoot an arrow into the air where it lands, paint a bullseye. These are the drawings I do to be able to construct what I'm thinking about. I try and temporalize them, but a lot of that is guesswork. And the largest part of my job as an action inventor is to figure out what my questions are. Oh, okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>